Hey everybody, Matt from 90thPercentile.ca here. For access to more study notes, practice questions, mock exams, and end chapter question videos, visit 90thPercentile.ca and sign up for your free trial today. Link below in the description. All right, for this learning module, financial analysis techniques, we're basically wrapping up everything that we've learned in the last three modules, which was understanding income statements, understanding balance sheets, and understanding cash flow statements. And we're going to combine all of that knowledge to you know, compare the health of a company at a certain point in time against itself or compare company to company using various ratios. Um, the most common ones being activity ratios, liquidity ratios, solvency ratios, and profitability ratios. Um, so we're going to understand, you know, the most popular types of ratios to look at in each category and what that implies for the health or outlook of a company. And finally, at the very end, we'll touch, touch on the DuPont analysis, which is basically an analysis which decomposes ROE or return on equity into a bunch of different components to kind of understand um, the inner workings of the ROE formula and how different business decisions across all three statements impact return on equity. So let's jump right in. Which of the following would best explain an increase in receivables turnover? Well, what is receivables turnover? It is revenue over average receivables. Uh, really quick note, if you're ever calculating like, like the three common turnover ratios of receivables turnover, inventory turnover and uh, accounts payable turnover. So if you're, if, if you're calculating inventory turnover, it's kind of the same concept where you have average inventory in the denominator, but on top you're gonna use COGS. And the thinking is that COGS, you know, is more related to inventory than revenue. Um, and then at the same time, payables turnover would be your purchases over your average payables. So you're just comparing apples to apples. But anyway, if we're going to explain an increase in receivables turnover, either our revenue is going to have to increase or our, or our receivables, average receivables are going to have to go down. So we'll see from the options which one um, that's the case for. So in A, the company adopted new credit policies last year and began, began offering credit to customers with weak credit histories. Well, no, that this would increase our average receivables, right? B, due to problems with an error in its old credit scoring system, the company has accumulated substantial amount of uncollectible accounts and wrote off a large amount of its receivables. Well, this is it, right? Because this would de decrease our average receivables. Crown Corporation had an average days of sales outstanding. So AR of uh, 19 days in the most recent fiscal year. So 19 days. Brown wants to improve its credit policies and collection practices and decrease its collection period in the next fiscal year to match the industry average of 15 days. So we're going to decrease it to 15 days. Credit sales in the most recent fiscal year were 300 million. So 300 mil here. And we're expecting 390 million next year. To achieve Brown's goal of decreasing the collection period, the change in the average accounts receivable balance that must occur is closest to which one of these. So we just got to calculate the um, AR balance. The, the change in the AR balance based on 19 days outstanding at 300 mil and 15 days outstanding at uh, 390 mil. So for the first one, we would do 300 million over um, 19 times 365. And this would get an answer of 15.62 million. And then for B, or for the second part, it's the same thing, 390 over 15 times 365 equals 16.03. And the difference is going to be um, the 16.03 minus 15.62, which we get uh, 0 0.41 million. So our answer is A. All right, we got a long question here. 
an analyst observes the following data for two companies. We have revenue, net income, and then some balance sheet items. So current assets, total assets, current liabilities, total debt, shareholders equity. And the question is, which one of the following choices best describes reasonable conclusions that the analyst might make about the two companies' ability to pay their current and long-term obligations? So we're going to be looking at liquidity and solvency here. Question like this, um, I, I would just go question or answer by answer. Um, you know, really no, no other strategy to it. And in the first one, we have company A's current ratio of 4.0 indicates that it's more liquid than company B. So let's look at the current ratio assets, uh, no, sorry, current assets, current liabilities. Yep. 4.0. And then here it's 1.2. So a the current ratio is 4.0, which is right. And the, for B it's company B. 1.2 so we're more liquid according to the current ratio because we have more current assets to fund our current liabilities uh, yep more liquid than company B's ratio is 1.2 but company B is more solvent as indicated by its lower debt to equity ratio so debt to equity for a company B is 150,000 over 500 and company A is 60 over 30 so we have two times as much debt as equity here. Here it's like, I don't know, 150 over 500 is like 0.3 something, 0.4. Um, so it is lower. You can just tell by by looking at it. Um, and in this case, yes, company B is more, you gotta be careful with the word in here as well. Company B is more solvent because it has less debt on its books relative to equity. So A is actually our answer, we got lucky. Um, sometimes you just have to make your way down the list, but here we got lucky and A is the answer. Which of the following ratios would be more most useful in determining a company's ability to cover its lease and interest payments? ROA, return on assets. Nope. We're worried about interest and lease payments, um, which are essentially, you know, can be thought of as debt. So we're looking at something similar to like an interest coverage ratio right here. So like the typical interest coverage ratio is EBITDA over interest um, here we're actually looking for yeah the fixed charge coverage ratio which is similar um, but it could be like EBIT you can even have with the duh in brackets you can do EBITDA as well like sometimes people do slightly different ratios depending on what you're looking for um, typically this fixed charge coverage is just EBIT though um, and it's EBIT over interest plus these payments as well. So we add in the lease here and we don't include the depreciation here. That's the only difference between the typical interest coverage and the fixed charge coverage ratio. So this is our answer. Uh, total asset turnover, kind of similar to ROA. Um, so it's more, you know, these are more useful for like profitability metrics, ROA especially. So um, not as relevant when you're talking interest coverage. So C is our answer. Here we have some financial or some income statement data and some balance sheet data for this company across five years, 2010 to 2014. Gonna have a couple questions on this, but the first one is the company's total assets at year end 19 or year end, I guess 2009, were uh, 3. Uh, I guess 3.5 billion. Which of the following choices best describes reasonable conclusions an analyst might make about the company's efficiency? So. Here, comparing uh, year 14 to 10, the company's efficiency improved as indicated by its total asset turnover ratio of 0.86 compared with 0.64. Comparing uh, 14 to 10, the company's efficiency deteriorated as indicated by its current ratio. It has crossed this one all right away. Current ratio is more related to liquidity, not efficiency. And then the last one here, we're also talking about uh, efficiency and it deteriorated due to asset growth faster than turnover revenue growth. So we're gonna have to calculate the asset turnover ratio from um, year 14 and year 10. So we'll do year 10 first, and it is gonna be your revenue in the year. So 4390 divided by your average total asset. So that's why they, they gave us this uh, 3.5 billion here for 
for year nine because we're going to have to take the average with year 10. So we can look and find their total assets right here. So it's going to be 4390, the revenue over 4384 plus the 3.5. And this is going to be divided by two. So if we calculated this, it would be um, 1.11. And then if you do 14, same concept, you take our revenue, some good revenue growth, which is 11,366 divided by, we have assets from the last year and then this year. So it's 12,250 plus 13,799 over two. And if you calculated this, it would be it's going to be less than one. Yeah, it's 0 0.87. So now coming back to the questions, we can see that, yeah, their efficiency decreased from 2010 to 2014, right? Because they're, they're not turning over um, as much revenue related to their asset base. So coming back to the, the answers, yeah, their company's efficiency deteriorated. So this is our answer. And you can see even in A, uh, the efficiency improved 0.8. So yeah, like this must've just been someone messed up the calculations. Um, so like if you did these calcs, right, you would have to get it, have to get the answer, right. Um, yeah, here they must've just taken maybe fixed assets instead to calculate the values, but regardless, our answer is C same data set. But now, which of the following choices best describes reasonable conclusions an analyst might make about the company's solvency? A, comparing year 14 to 10, the company's solvency improved as indicated by an increase in its debt to assets ratio from 0.14 to 0.27. So we can calculate it really quickly. So in 10, we have uh, looking for long-term debt right here. It's a negative just because it's like, I guess it's a liability. They're trying to show like debit, debits and credits here, but you like couldn't have negative long-term debt, right? So it's really just 602 over total assets right here, 4384. Um, and note that here we're using a debt to assets ratio, which we don't take the average total assets. This is like a snapshot in time versus revenue, which, you know, takes place throughout the whole year. Then you would use the average assets over the period um, to calculate the, the turnover ratios there. But here's just a snapshot in time. And if we calculate this, 602 divided by 4384, which is 0 0.137. So we'll just call it 0 0.14 to take the, the answer. And then in year 14, We got same same thing, so it's gonna be a three seven oh seven and total assets of this. So three seven oh seven and then total assets are thirteen seven nine nine. And if we calculate that, it is zero point two seven. So the numbers tie out here. Um But here, yeah, okay, so the, the solvency didn't improve, right? So we have more debt relative to our assets now. So our solvency actually got worse. So although these numbers are right, this, this answer here is wrong. So if we're moving on, um, comparing year 14 to 10, the company's solvency deteriorated as indicated by a decrease in its interest coverage from 10.6 to 8.4. So we can do the same thing, compare each year. Interest coverage is going to be usually EBITDA, but we have EBIT here. So EBIT in both years. So 844 here. And then in year 14, it's 1579. And where's our interest expense? I guess net interest payable. Kind of a weird way to describe it as a line item. Let's just double check, make sure there's nothing else. No, this is all balance sheet accounts. Yep, it's going to be the net interest payable. Usually just called the interest expense, but you know, 
it is what it is. Um, so 8.44 over 80, this isn't going to be negative, it's going to be positive when you calculate it. And then over here, it's 188. So in year 10, it's 8.44 divided by 80, which is 10.55, close enough to 10.6, like the answer. And then up top, it's 15.79 over 188, which is 8.4. So we have the numbers right again, just to make sure the wording makes sense. So the company's solvency deteriorated. Yeah, so it did deteriorate, right? Because now we have less EBIT to cover our our interest expense on our debt. So when you have less cash from operations or EBIT, using that as a proxy to cover your debt, you're, you have worse solvency. So B is the answer. Which of the following choices best describes reasonable conclusions an analyst might make? So same kind of thing. We just have different answers here. Comparing year 14 to 10, the company's liquidity improved as indicated by an increase in its debt to assets ratio from 0.14 to 0.27. So here we, you know, we can actually take a shortcut and not even calculate these ratios because if the debt to assets ratio increased, their liquidity is getting worse because they have more debt on the books, right? So we can just cross this one off right away. Um, from year 14 to 10, the company's liquidity deteriorated as indicated by a decrease in its interest coverage ratio from 10.6 to 8.4. We just calculated that, didn't we? So we have the 10, we, we were able to confirm that these numbers were, were correct. But once again, the wording here, their liquidity deteriorated. This is actually um, more related to solvency, right? Interest coverage is, is solvency, not liquidity. Um, and solvency, of course, is your ability to meet long-term obligations and your interest on your debt is your long-term, our, our, our long-term obligations, right? So we can cross this one off as well. This is our answer. Last question on this data set. Which of the following choices best describes reasonable conclusions? You know, same kind of wording. A, comparing year 14 to 10, the company's profitability improved as indicated by an increase in its debt to assets ratio from 0.14 to 0.27. So this isn't related to profitability right this is more related to capital structure and leverage so you can cross that one off profitability is going to have some some metric like net income or EBITDA or gross margin or something like that going on uh, comparing year 14 to 10 the company's profitability deteriorated as indicated by a decrease in its net profit margin so profitability net profit that's good from 11 percent to 5.7 percent so we can calculate that now we haven't calculated the net profit margin yet so in year 10, where is our net income? Profit for the year right here. So 484 over revenue, which is 4390. And then year 14, so this was the revenue. Um, year 14 is 645 net profit over 113366 in revenue. So if we calculate these, in year 10 we got Sorry, one sec. 11%. And then in year 14, we got, yeah, 5.7%. So this is our answer. Last question, we have a decomposition of ROE for this company. So we have return on equity, tax burden, interest burden, EBIT margin, asset turnover, and leverage. And before we Going to the questions here, I, I want to divert your attention to these formulas, which I took from my notes. And this is known as the DuPont analysis. And all the DuPont analysis does is it breaks down ROE or return on equity, which is typically your net income over your average equity for the year. And it breaks us down into a bunch of different ratios that show, you know, what's going on behind the scenes and how different business decisions impact the return on equity, right? So there's three main formulas here. They all just go into more detail. First one, if we're looking at it, we have net income over assets, which is our return on assets. Then we have assets over equity here. Um, and if we you know, multiply these together, this and this cancel out, and we're left with net income over average equity. But the key point across all these formulas is that any 
increasing these ratios will increase ROE, right? So here, net income over revenues, profit, your profit margin, and then revenue over assets, and then assets over equity. Once again, left with net income over equity. And then finally, net income over EBT, so earnings before tax. So this is actually like a tax burden because um, the only difference between net income and EBT is your tax. Here you have EBT over EBIT, which is your interest burden because you know the only thing missing from the numerator is interest. So these cancel out. Then we have EBIT over revenue, which is just an EBIT margin. Once again, revenue over assets and then assets over equity. And you're left with net income over average shareholders equity. So an increase in any of these ratios here will result in an increase in ROE. So coming back to the question, which of the following choices best describes the reasonable conclusions an analyst might make based on this ROE decomposition? First thing you might want to look at is that ROE stayed the same year over year at 18.9%. And for A, profitability, <clears throat> profitability and the liquidity position both improved in year 12. Um, well, we can look at a profitability metric. The EBIT margin stayed the same year over year. So this isn't our answer. Profitability didn't improve, right? It stayed the same. For B, the higher average tax rate in year 12 offset the improvement in profitability. Once again, there was no improvement in profitability, so you can cross this one off as well. And then for C, the higher average tax rate offset the improvement in efficiency, leaving ROE unchanged. So this is going to be our answer, but we can validate this anyway. The higher average tax rate, so we can see the tax burden here decreased to 0.7. Um, from 0.75, so that's that was this formula here, remember? So like if net income over earnings before tax, if this whole ratio decreased, um, then yeah, it, it makes more sense that the tax, you know, the tax rate decreased, um, leaving this numerator smaller, right? So we could have like 0 0.7 or like, 700 of net income versus like a thousand of EBIT. And then the 0.7 is our net income left over. So we had like 0 0.3 in taxes uh, or 30% tax rate. And that would be different. So like in, in 11 here, we have 0.75. So this would be the 25% tax rate, right? So the tax rate did increase. That's right. Um, so tax rate increasing would decrease this ratio, which would decrease ROE. And then that offset the improvement in efficiency. So efficiency, yeah, is the asset turnover ratio here, which did improve. So it looked, it, this answer summarizes it properly, right? We had a increase in taxes, which decreased our tax burden, which is here. So that decreased our ROE. But then we had an increase in asset turnover, revenue over assets, which offset this and left ROE unchanged.